Happy Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Bammers. I'm Matt Scalisi, and I'm joined by Ben Flanagan. We are here uh, to talk about one of the one of the most I was I was going to say most frequently discussed topics, but I guess that's kind of the point is that it's not. It's not frequently discussed enough. We want to talk about some players who don't get as much love and don't get as much talk uh, as some of their 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 superstar brethren out of the Nick Saban era at Alabama. We want to today go through some picks that we made for guys that we think are the most underrated Alabama players of the Saban era. And as always, this show is interactive, and we want you guys to – Throw your picks in the comments as well. Tell us some names that you think don't get enough love uh, on this, you know, on any of the Bama teams going back to 2007. Um, but Ben, this this is um, this is a list that honestly, sometimes I think we stretch a little bit, and we have to we have to try and and uh, reach to come up with some picks for our lists. This was not one of those. This one, there's so many names. I mean, even even from two seasons ago, it's very easy for a guy to suddenly become overshadowed after being a really important contributor to this program because really just because of volume, just because there's so many guys who become such a big deal. Yeah. You think of all who came before these guys, all who came after them, but even all who are on the same team as these guys, the, it's hard to stand out on a Nick Saban team because you're obviously talking about several all Americans at a time. Right. And sometimes even the all Americans are underrated on Nick Saban's team, which is hard to believe, hard to conceive, but it's true. But uh, yeah, even, even Saban has underrated players, but I think Matt, like it's hard to judge underrated versus uh, properly rated. I think, you know, mythology builds over time, right? With these Alabama teams and these players where at some point they, they do become sort of properly rated, I think, and, and, and celebrated in the eyes of a lot of Alabama fans who seem to, who probably look back on most, if not all players as uh, great or, uh, you know, contributing uh, players to these national championships and this dynasty. And they consider them very important overall. Uh, but yeah, I think that these guys, uh, the way I would put it, Less underrated, more or less celebrated, I think, than than some of these other guys who are just, you know, their legacies were, were in stone while they were on campus. For sure. I mean, I, I think a lot of these guys that we're going to talk about, they they were they were certainly hailed in their time. I mean, they were recognized. You you it's hard not to be at Alabama, but I, I think I think it it's funny to me that one of the phenomenons of this is I think, especially for for people our age, Ben, guys in their 30s who who very distinctly remember the pre Saban era, you know, if there was an All American on the team at Alabama, he was talked about for years. I mean, they they put him they put him on the jumbotron in the pregame montages, and people <laughs> still talked about him years after he was gone because you're still waiting for the next guy to come along and maybe not overshadow him, but but make you forget. Uh, about how good it was, and I think that's that's the part of it that's become, I think, sped up in the Saban era. It's not that we forget about these guys so fast. It's just that somebody else comes along that's worth paying attention to so quickly after them. Yeah, it, it's interesting because, you know, we did that episode a few weeks ago about players we love watching in the NFL, and we talked about how there was a point when – the list was not quite as long as it is now, just in terms of like guys in the NFL stats you can keep up with. You kind of like lose track of who all is pro at this point. But back then, like when I was growing up, yeah, you had guys like Sean Alexander, Chris Samuels, D'Amico Ryans, who, who for, for one reason or another, there were these all American type players that everybody singled out for many years. Right. And not to disparage their teammates, right? Like they played on th their share of great Alabama teams, and everybody on those teams was a was a contributor. But uh, yeah, it's just it's been wild in the Saban era to to once again lose track of some of these in just incredible players who are playing with equally incredible players. Well, let's we're going to go through our picks, Ben. We we've got a few picked out each that we wanted to talk about today, but. Again, as we're doing this, please uh, throw names out that you think 
are guys who don't get the the attention and the and the recognition that they deserve. Underrated Bama players for you. Uh, throw them in the comments wherever you're watching, whether it's YouTube or Facebook, and we will pop them up on screen while we're having our discussion of our picks as well. So, Ben, why don't you give me your your first name that you wanted to talk about today? So, like you said, we have a long list to choose from, right? Sure. And I, wa- I want to mention every list that I had or every every name that I have on like my honorable mentions, so to speak. Any of these guys could have been on this top three that we're talking about. My first guy is going to be Vinny Sanceri, the safety from the 2012 through 2013 era, I think was probably the height of his career. Just a really steady defensive playmaker, great tackler, excellent on special teams, especially as a freshman when he and Trey DePriest were just these headhunters on kickoff coverage. Uh, a good leader, a guy who played with a lot of swagger, I think, a ball hawk. He, he was just, he made plays. And, and we've talked before about that amazing uh, pick six off Johnny Manziel in the in, in College Station in 2013 when he uh, juked the offense out of their shoes for this 73-yard touchdown return just created an amazing memory. And it was really devastating in, in 2013 when he tore his ACL in a 52 to nothing uh, win over Arkansas. Um, it's hard to look back on that Auburn game, especially that kick six game, uh, and, and not think that he wouldn't have made a difference uh, in, in that game. It's a big what if for me personally. I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe none at all. Um, but there are just so many other defensive backs that we could have included here. Guys like Robert Lester, for instance, who was just this interception machine. Uh, but I thought that Sunseri was just a really fantastic player who had even more potential that got cut short by injury. Yeah, I, I definitely, when I think of Vinny Sunseri, that Texas A&M interception return is the play that, that first comes to mind for me. I also remember, um, I, I think it was, I think it was 2012. I'm trying to remember what season it was that Alabama opened against Michigan in Dallas. Uh, but I remember Vinny Sanceri had a big memorable stop in that game too. Just, you know, I, I, I think for some of these guys, my, and look, all of us, I think, have our own different experience with these players. And this was a, this, this early part of the Saban era was a group that I got to have a little bit of a different experience with because I was still covering recruiting. And I, and I talked to a bunch of these guys before they were at Bama. So I had some semblance of what their personalities were like. And Vinny, it it was very funny to me because he was, he was, uh, I, I would say extremely, uh, polite, straight-laced guy when you talk to him, and he he was he was definitely a kid from um, from parents. I, I would say, as growing up an Italian American man myself, I would say <laughs> he reminded me a little bit of of what I remember growing up with, which is that you were you were taught to have a certain amount of reverence for people older than you. And even though I didn't feel that much <laughs> older than him, uh, that's how he spoke to me. And, you know, very buttoned down guy. And then you see him on the field and there's such huge energy and personality. And it was such a funny contrast to me to see that. Uh, He was just a a guy that clearly loved playing defensive football. I mean, there there are some dudes who I think would thrive at any position. Hard for me to imagine Vinny Sanceri doing anything other than playing defense. Yeah, you're right. And he had a lot of personality and that's probably what stuck out uh, in a big way. Like I said, he played with a lot of swagger and you really uh, he, he had a presence on the field for sure. He made his presence known through his hitting, uh, but also through that personality. But I'm telling you, when he got hurt in, in that Arkansas game, I remember feeling in the moment that's a big blow. Like this is going to hurt the team that Vinny Sanceri is no longer playing for the rest of this season and, and, you know, the team obviously lost one regular season game in historic fashion. So maybe, maybe you know, flip of a coin, they may have won that game and, and gone on to win a national championship even without Vinny Sanceri. But like I said, it's a big what if. For sure. And uh, already some good suggestions in here in the comments that I wanted to throw up. Matt Lunsford had a, had a couple of really good ones. Nick Gentry, Nick Perry, Bobby Greenwood, and Kyle Tatum. <laughs> Definitely, that whole category I would I would put in the group that we would call uh, guys that that played with a big motor, guys with a lot of heart. You know, I mean, and you, and it's it's the type of player that, frankly, I don't know that you see a ton of at Alabama anymore. Not not to question anyone's motivation, but what I mean is, 
those are all really guys who were not very highly rated recruits. They were not blue chip guys with huge expectations on them coming in. And they, they really overachieved um, for what they were expected to do. Nick Gentry is a fun one to remember. That That's a guy that um, was, if I can remember correctly, he was basically like a defensive player you'd bring in on third down. Um, just kind of a, just kind of a, an edge rush, you know, run, you know, if you absolutely need to get a stop on a third and short, Nick Gentry was the guy they'd throw in there. Absolutely. He was, he was a lot of fun to watch too. He was one of those guys, if I remember correctly, uh, a, a football player that never wore gloves. Uh, you, you always remember <laughs> players like that. That's like a very workmanlike quality with a lot of players. I'm sure like we could go back and and find a lot of players who didn't wear gloves. And you always wonder, how come they don't wear gloves? They don't just like the feeling or what? Like, I don't know what it is, but when you don't wear gloves, you stand out. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you, you mentioned, not not blue chip recruits necessarily. And again, underrated guys like this uh, comments were mentioned, but it's like there's a reason they're on the field in the national championship game. So they just sure. work, work their tails off, make plays and make names for themselves. Uh, another, my, so my first pick I want to talk about, by the way, is, is somebody who definitely made a big splash in a national championship game. As you mentioned, uh, Kevin Norwood is my first name I want to talk about today. And this is a, this is a dude who, uh, did play in 2010. He, he was on the field, play, played in every game basically in 2010. Um, but I remember first really making his big splash in 2011. He had, um, you know, comparatively, not huge stats in that season, but I can I can certainly remember Kevin Norwood making a a huge clutch uh, reception in that national championship game against LSU with with uh, I believe it was Teran Matthew draped all over him um, and and if I'm even I might be I might be confusing this with another catch I seem to remember Kevin Norwood had one of these little elastic kind of armbands uh, around his bicep. And I, and I can even remember <laughs> this image once you'd see after the game of, of Matthew's finger is hooked under the armband and Kevin Norwood <laughs> is still making the catch. And, and for some reason that image has just really stuck with me and, and showed me that, that, that this, was, this was a guy that was going to be worth paying attention to going forward. He was, he was not a, a, a third or fourth receiver on this team. He was really about to become a very important player uh, in the in the post Julio era, before we had really gotten Alabama into this mode where there just is always one, two, three uh, first round type NFL receivers, Kevin Norwood never gets that level of hype, and I understand it because his stats were never huge, um, but just such a reliable player and a guy that made out of a relatively few number of total reception is receptions in his career a very high percentage of them were very important were clutch plays um made some big plays in 2012 for that national championship team but but also uh, can remember you know 2013 he was a big part of that of that team as well but again like it's funny ben looking at this at his career stats we're only talking about 12 total receiving touchdowns over the course of his career uh, about 1200 or so receiving yards over the course of his career I mean we've we've now seen receivers who get that in a season um, or or well well over that but this this is this is a guy I think who who gets lost in the shovel in the shuffle because he's from the era where really Julio was the template for receivers and and that meant making the most of your opportunities more so than just being the guy, the, the bread and butter of the entire offense. Great pick. Um, I, he, he, to me, like probably belongs on the Mount Rushmore of underrated Alabama players, at least in the Saban era. Um, you're right. Like the stats don't tell the whole story. Cause I mean, like you look at this guy, Kevin Norwood, and, and he's beloved by fans. Like fans remember this guy as just being, Clutch, like you said, that is the adjective that people will use to describe him for the rest of his life, and and for good reason. And he's the LSU killer too. I mean, you mentioned those Matthew catches uh, in that 2011 national championship game. I think a lot of people will also remember Kevin Norwood for that 2012 LSU game, the the big drive comeback. You talk about the screen pass with TJ Yeldon, but 
leading up to that, you had Kevin Norwood making one catch after another, and he may not have had as many touchdowns, but those first downs on that drive to keep it alive are just as good as touchdowns, and and they are catches that people will always remember, and that will be his legacy at Alabama. So Kevin Norwood belongs on this list, arguably the most underrated player at Alabama. But you're right, like when you have names like Amari Cooper and Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, and this just – Devontae Smith, obviously, the greatest uh, of all. Um, this just incredible list of uh, wide receivers, guys who've gone on, obviously, to the NFL and had amazing success. It's it's e- easy to get lost in the shuffle, and there are a lot of guys like that. Like, our Darius Stewart is another guy, I think, who's underrated. I mean, our Darius Stewart led the team in receiving in 2016, uh, and, it, you know, he was just a really tough guy, kind of like uh, Norwood, one of these, like, possession receivers, right, uh, DeAndre White is another guy, this a great receiver in the shadow of Amari Cooper, an NFL caliber receiver who who made a lot of big plays, like a game winning uh, touchdown against LSU in overtime in, in I think 2014. So That's there right. are some amazing receivers uh, who who don't get enough credit for their contributions to the team, contributions to national championship wins, and I think Norwood is uh, just emblematic of that. For sure, uh, I, I, another couple that that uh, have been thrown out. I, you already you already mentioned Ardarius Stewart. Uh, he was getting some talk in the comments. Also, Cyber Honey throwing out OJ Howard. Now, OJ Howard's a big. <laughs> I, I mean, he he's a, a known commodity in the NFL at this point. But I will say, I, a weird example of a guy who was probably underrated while at Alabama. <laughs> underused. Uh, yeah, underrated. Underused. Yeah. Uh, and and I I think. I think just a guy who sort of you talk about making it count. I mean, he, he was a guy who wasn't a huge part of the offense until it absolutely counted the most. Yeah. All right, Ben. What's uh, what's the next name on your list? Next for me, I, I'm I'm sticking with defense. I'm going Dalvin Tomlinson, and and when you have names like Jonathan Allen and Reuben Foster, Mika Fitzpatrick, Ashawn Robinson, Deron Payne, Marlon Humphrey, it's hard to stand out. It really is. I mean, these are, again, all American caliber players, first round draft picks. But Tomlinson did his business quietly and was just such a dependable force, anchoring just an amazing defensive line, just as important to the, the uh, success of the team as Jonathan Allen and, and Robinson and Payne and just uh, a guy uh, starting and playing in the NFL at this point. So, you know, maybe he is properly rated just in terms of, look, I mean, this guy was NFL caliber. He made it. He's playing. He's getting paid uh, at first for the New York Giants. Now a pickup for the uh, Minnesota Vikings in the offseason. It's great to see him doing well. uh, But he is a guy that I consider a bit of an unsung hero on those incredible defenses of the mid-2010s. For sure. Uh, You know, I I think – I think he's he's a name that I recall as, um, you know, he he had a particularly again we talked about Benny Sanceri and 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 sort of how he fit what you saw on the field personality wise really well. But Dalvin Tomlinson, I think also I I I'm sure that he's a very uh, a very amiable dude in real life, but I, I can remember thinking this dude this dude looks intimidating and and even <laughs> even at media day even at press conferences this was a guy who just sort of radiated this that defensive line meanness um out of out of every bit of him and and I think I think that it, it was it was a as you mentioned a long streak of guys that Alabama had at those interior defensive line positions who were just sort of absolutely terrifying, and it didn't matter, especially if you were an opponent. Um, it's almost like the the old adage of of waiting until that guy finally leaves, and and you don't have to deal with him anymore. There, it wasn't happening in Alabama. There was always another guy. Yeah, I remember him being relatively mild mannered. Like his personality wasn't quite as big as some of the guys that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but he, and, and also an interesting little tidbit about Dal- Dalvin Tomlinson was that he was a high school wrestler. And I remember he, our he, commenters he, brought that up actually. Yeah. Yeah. He was a high school wrestler. And I remember his teammates, he was very well liked on the team. I remember that. And they would always bring that up as, as being a bit of a, you don't mess with uh, Dalvin Tomlinson. Uh, 
because this guy actually knows how to how to take care of himself, at least on the wrestling mat, uh, but obviously on the football field too. He was really fun to watch, and he, he was a guy that I was sad to see go. For sure. A fun a fun one. I, I've got a, – Ben, you've got two offensive – or two defensive players you picked so far. I'm going with another offensive player for my second pick. Um, and it's a guy – you know, there's there's – there's obviously so many great wide receivers that everybody remembers and great running backs. And, and Alabama's now become this absurd collection of offensive skill position players. But there are sometimes guys who have not really fit into an easy category. And I think that's part of why they don't get talked about as much. And my pick is one of those guys. It's Jalston Fowler, um, who, who technically was a, a running back at Alabama, you know, I mean, but, but there, there's no other comparison to him. They're, they're really, I guess the, the, the closest thing you could point to is to say that he was the equivalent of what a fullback would, would be in, in sort of the eighties and nineties in football, but that's not what he did. And that's not a really good description of how he was used at Alabama. Um, you know, his, his you, you look at his career stat line and it doesn't at all describe his contributions to the team. Uh, he, he had, he had a, I, I would say he was used more like a traditional running back probably earlier in his career. You go back to his first two seasons and he played as a true freshman, uh, in 2010, he played, um, an even bigger role in 2011, um, where he, he had 56 rushing attempts, four touchdowns. He was a pretty big part of the offense in 2011, um, got hurt in 2012 and didn't play very much and, and, and got to medical red shirt that season. But then you go, you, you really, I think where he kind of cemented how I think of him now was in 2013 and 14 when he became this player that, again, I think he was used a little bit like an up back. Um, but, but he, you know, he certainly would be on the field in short yardage situations a lot and was a great blocker. But I think he was, he, he had this unique element to him where, I think his appearance uh, and his build kind of deceived a lot of defenses into thinking that's what he's going to do out there. We're putting him out here to to be a blocker, a lead blocker for the running back. And that's more often than not, it feels like they would throw to him. Um, and in fact, his senior season in 2014, he had 11 receptions, two of them for touchdowns. He had 129 receiving yards. Uh, he averaged 11.7 yards per catch as a senior. And this, this is, this is like this little squat bowling ball of a, of a running back. Um, just a really unique player that I don't think we've seen Alabama do anything like this with another player. And it's just because Fowler was such a unique guy. I, I think maybe they tried to do a few of those things with Josh Jacobs. Um, but it, it, there just really isn't another comparison to him. Yeah, it's a great pick and, and another guy that fans really look back on with a lot of fondness. And you mentioned his his role as, as a receiver. If, if I'm looking at this correctly, if the stats are right, in 2013, uh, while A.J. McCarron was still the quarterback, Fowler had seven receptions and five of those were for touchdowns. Yeah. So uh, just just a <laughs> very is, yeah. Produ- yeah, very productive guy when his number was called. And, and uh, obviously you mentioned the blocking, which obviously doesn't show up in the stat sheet, but – he, he was a just fundamentally important part of the offense uh, the many years that he played at Alabama. So um, it, he, he was he was really fun to watch, and he's a guy who did have some success in the NFL too, played for the Tennessee Titans for a little while. So it was fun to see him show up in, in the NFL stat lines. So, yeah, Jalston Fowler, great player. A couple more uh, good suggestions out there that I wanted to bring up real quick. Brad Smelly brought up there a uh, very, very solid tight end player for Alabama. Glenn Coffey as well, who we're not going to, I don't think we're going to talk about Glenn in, in great depth today, but obviously a very important player in Alabama football history really was, uh, I would say, part of what kind of got the Saban era rolling. 2008, uh, that, that season doesn't go like it goes without Glenn Coffey for sure. Even with all the great young players on that team, uh, Glenn Coffey was a huge anchor to the, the turnaround for Alabama. Yeah, I like all the tight ends getting love here. Right? Yeah. Like you have guys like Colin Peake, uh, uh, guys yeah. like uh, Michael Williams, uh, 
Obviously, uh, Irv Smith uh, was a really good tight end, but he obviously went on. Well, he was drafted in the first round, right, for for the Minnesota Vikings, if I have that right. Um, Jaleel Billingsley, I think, is another guy who, who has yeah. an opportunity to be really special, maybe even underrated, uh, considering – uh, you know, where the passes have gone the last couple of years in terms of like the, the explosive wide receivers. But uh, yeah, good to see the tight ends, the H backs. They do a lot of the heavy lifting and uh, their, their names don't get called out on television quite as much. So it's good to hear. All right. What's your next pick, Ben? So my next pick, I'm going to all three defensive players. Here, Interesting. Matt. And, and, and my last pick is Sean Dion Hamilton. And I think that when you ask somebody, to name the best linebackers of the Saban era. People are, look, rightly quick to say guys like Rolando McClain and C.J. Mosley, Reuben Foster, Reggie Ragland. Um, but I think Hamilton might fall through the cracks a little bit. And, look, nobody has ever been more solid for the team than he was, like on, on, on some really dominant defenses too. And and we, we talked about injuries before with Sanceri, but – Losing Hamilton before the college football playoff in 2016, I, I think, was just pivotal for Alabama. And they'd already lost Eddie Jackson prior to that during the regular season. So you take away another really productive guy, a leader who was such a constant, who made so many plays, knew the defense you know, front and back. Uh, that put Alabama in a really tough position against Clemson in that national championship game. Another big what if. For me, if, if uh, Hamilton and Jackson had been available for that game, but it is what it is. Injuries are part of the game. Uh, he's a starter in the NFL now, too, like Tomlinson. So perhaps he's properly rated. Uh, but, I, but I think he is a little bit less celebrated than some of those guys that I mentioned. Sean Dion Hamilton, just an, an outstanding player at Alabama. Yeah, and another uh, another guy that I think, you know, was was part of an interesting shift uh, or, or streak, if you will, for Alabama for a little while of a, a bunch of linebacker prospects, really great linebackers from for Alabama, were homegrown guys for for a for a pretty long shift of time, and I, I think um, you know you're starting to see that go a little bit more national at this point. But for whatever reason, the state of Alabama had this really great streak there um, of producing elite linebackers and, and Alabama really benefited from that. And you mentioned Reuben Foster, Sean Deon Hamilton, who I believe went to Carver in Montgomery um, was a big part of that. And Mac Wilson, uh, who went to the same high school was, was kind of followed in Sean Deon Hamilton's footsteps. You had Rashawn Evans from Auburn high school, uh, just a, a, a tremendous uh, line of, homegrown talent at the linebacker position. And I, I, I think maybe that's part of why uh, Hamilton doesn't get as much talk uh, as well, may, maybe as some of the other guys, but, but it's, it's rare to see that I think in, in the Saban era, it, it, if I was going to characterize recruiting or talent uh, by any one sort of given property during the Saban era, it would be that that's, Alabama became elite because they became a national recruiting powerhouse and they got the best players from every, every corner of the country. Uh, there really is no limitation at all on where Alabama can go to get a player. And so it's, it's interesting that for such a long stretch of time, they were getting great linebackers from right around the corner. Yeah, absolutely. All those guys that you mentioned, Rolando McClain was a guy from Alabama too. And, and, it's just uh, – it's amazing what they've done at that position. Like, you hear all these people talk about, like, linebacker you, uh, wide receiver you, running back you. Alabama, I think, has a case for linebacker you, to be sure, uh, with with all the guys that we mentioned, especially when a guy like Sean Deon Hamilton, a, a productive NFL player, now for the Detroit Lions, previously for the Washington Redskins, uh, but especially when a guy like Sean Deon Hamilton, who's that good, is, is considered an unsung hero – of uh, all the linebackers who have come and gone in Tuscaloosa. For sure. All right. my I, Before we get to my last pick, a couple of really good suggestions in the comments here from Scott Vandiver. Kenny Bell. Love love seeing Kenny Bell's name come up. <laughs> Definitely uh, a, a an old school throwback name in the Saban era, but a guy that I, I, I probably haven't invoked his name very much since – uh, Henry Ruggs III kind of became the new standard of the deep threat guy, but that's what Kenny Bell was. He was 
He was just take off running down the field, vertical routes, uh, and just get the ball in front of him, and and the defense can't keep up with him. He was he was a great, very fast vertical threat. Uh, another really good suggestion in here, Josh Chapman, uh, mm-hmm. the, the Hoover defensive lineman. Josh Chapman was a huge, huge part uh, of those first uh, Nick Saban championship contender teams, and uh, and and also just a really uh, likable guy. One, one of the most well-liked guys by the media back in that era. Yeah. Went on to be a, uh, assistant coach at Alabama. That's right. right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. One of those guys who just plugged the middle, like in the, in the tradition of obviously Terrence Cody, who sort of set like a new standard sure. of what like a run stopping defensive tackle looked like at Alabama. So Josh Chapman was that guy, uh, post Cody and, uh, yeah, fantastic pick. A, no, a nose guard who, who managed to to be effective like Terrence Cody without being 400 pounds. So props to Josh Chapman. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> look, that that is that's that's anecdotal that Terrence Cody once hit 400. But uh, right. okay, my last pick. I'm not going offense or defense, although this guy did did play more than special teams. But I'm picking him because of his special teams prowess. Uh, Cyrus Jones is my mm-hmm. last pick today, and this is a you know there there have been a lot of guys that I think have become known for being return specialists. I I, I could have mentioned Javier Arenas here, although I think he's I think people are showing Javier Arenas more and more appreciation over time. But um, you know Eddie Jackson, I think in addition to being an elite defensive back, known and remembered by a lot of people for being a great special teams player, I think. Jalen Waddell kind of has that label on him as well. But Cyrus Jones, I think, is a guy who doesn't get talked about very very much. And I, I think a lot of it's because he didn't score touchdowns as a return specialist. But that doesn't mean that he was not arguably the best return specialist that Alabama has had in the Saban era. I think there's an argument to make for that, particularly in 2012. Um, I mean, he was a very dangerous part of that team uh, in general, but I think he, you know, I mean, as a, as a receiver, he was, he was certainly um, a a strong threat as well. He was, he, he ended up evolving over the course of his career into a really strong DB, um, which, which was ultimately where he finished his career. But in the middle there, they really found a role for him as a great, return specialist and and particularly a kickoff return specialist where he ended up having 250 return yards uh, on just 10 kick returns. So he, he, you know, look, this 2012 team, it's going back to a time when Alabama's defense was so good uh, that they didn't receive a lot of kickoffs um, because the other team didn't score very much, hardly ever. But, but Cyrus Jones, um, you know, you're talking about, a guy who was on this this team that I think was to me when I think of 2012, I think of them as being kind of the ultimate balanced Alabama team. They were really really solid defense um, that 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 kind of kept them in any game, even if they weren't having a great day. But the offense could do a little bit of everything too, right? So it, it was this it was the kind of maybe the ideal, the platonic ideal of the all around great Alabama team. And I think that Cyrus Jones as a return specialist was a big part of that. And I think he, he was a, a very solid um, threat to put Alabama in really good field position whenever they would get a shot to do that. Uh, and, and he became a guy that they started kicking away from too, which also gives you good field position. So, you know, was he flashy? Was he, was he scoring these big, crazy touchdowns um, like, like we've seen from other return specialists. No, he didn't, he didn't get opportunities for that, but he was, he was, I think a guy who did, who contributed in so many different ways over the course of his Alabama career. And again, as, as a senior uh, it, it going to go into the 2014 season, a dude with three interceptions, um, you know, a, a guy with 13 pass deflections, uh, two forced fumbles. He, he, he was a as good a defensive back as we've seen from that era uh, for, during Nick Saban's time at Alabama, but also uh, really, really strong and dangerous special teams weapon.
Yeah, the, the game I really like remember Cyrus Jones for was uh, the 2015 Michigan State game when he had an amazing punt return for a touchdown. And he also had an inter- a key interception in that game. And obviously that was a blowout. Uh, that Alabama won, but uh, the plays that he made were just so crucial and, and important for that win. Um, also, I look back on uh, a Mississippi State game when I think he also had a, a touchdown uh, return for a touchdown, um, and and I, and I think picked off if I'm if I'm not mistaken, picked off Dak Prescott uh, relatively late in that game uh, to to give Alabama the ball back in, in in what became a competitive game when Alabama had previously been dominating it, but just a playmaker. I mean, like one of the best defensive backs of the Saban era. And that, like, don't, don't forget about it. Like, I mean, again, there, again, you, you lose track of these guys with all of the guys that you remember either for winning awards for winning national championships. Cyrus Jones was one of those guys. He he was a winner and he was a playmaker and he was, he was arguably the best player on defense uh, for a lot of those teams. And he's a guy I think people don't remember quite as well uh, because he had he was I think a second round pick for the New England Patriots uh, after he had left Alabama and his NFL career uh, didn't quite pan out as as hoped I think due to injury and other circumstances uh, but at Alabama Cyrus Jones was just an amazing player and and you're right I mean at this point he is definitely underrated but what he could do uh, returning punts and kicks like you said I mean he's right up there with with the likes of Jalen Waddle and Javier Arenas is just dangerous return specialists I mean we could do a list ranking Alabama's best uh, return men because uh, so it, it would be a I think a more heated debate than people realize uh, because of guys like Cyrus Jones he was really fun to watch for sure and I I don't know if he still holds this record I know in in his his last season at Alabama he did uh he did have the record for uh, most kick return yards in the season. He had 530 uh, total kick return yards. So he, he was, he, he is a guy who was again, uh, just, just such a, such a big part of multiple national championship teams at Alabama. Uh, but I just feel like we, do, we don't talk about him quite as much as some of the other players. So um, lots of really good suggestions again in the, um, in the comments today, Reggie Raglan, who we've, we've brought up in the course of talking, uh, talking about some other players, uh, particularly the linebacker guys. Uh, we mentioned Jaleel Billingsley already. Um, going, going back earlier in the program, I saw somebody mention Corey Reamer, definitely <laughs> big throwback. And that was a transitional guy from the Shula to Saban era. Uh, but they loved him at, at Alabama early on. Um, I mean, he was, Again, one of those guys I would say you don't see a lot of guys uh, with his kind of profile coming into Alabama these days, but he still played at, at, at a extremely high level. And, and I don't think you could find too many, too many coaches at Alabama that's, that would say uh, they wouldn't love to have Corey Reamer again. I mean, they, 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 he, Saban spoke extremely highly of him. Number 13, I think, uh, when he played oh, at Alabama. Right. The, yeah, I mean, you said Corey Reamer. Somebody said Bobby Greenwood earlier. Bobby Greenwood uh, take, was another taking, one, yes. Taking me back, man. I mean, you think <laughs> about guys like Eric Anders, you know, who, who obviously made the big play mm-hmm. in the national championship game and, and is now winning UFC fights. Um, I, I got to mention Bobby Greenwood famously. Uh, Joe Kynes once said that, that he would let Bobby Greenwood marry his daughter if he had one. So Great. that's how that's how much coaches loved Bobby Greenwood at Alabama. I'm glad somebody understood that to to <laughs> to, to pass on. Um, but yeah, one of, the, one of the most memorable compliments I've ever heard somebody get. <laughs> YouTube Joe Kynes, click the first video. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, let me run through a couple of honorable mentions here. Yeah. Uh, so I've got a lot of defensive guys. But some some guys on offense, Anthony Jennings. Anthony Jennings. We're not yes, quite great far. Re- we're not quite far removed from his uh, career at Alabama. He's playing for the New England Patriots now. But that guy just, again, playmaker. Like, made, he did so much for that defense. And, and again, you had these other guys, like, winning the awards and everything. But Anthony Jennings was crucial to the Alabama defense. I mentioned Ardarius Stewart. Isaiah Bugs was a guy, Isaiah I think. Isaiah Bugs is a good one, yeah. He was great. He played alongside, you know, Quinnen Williams and Raquan Davis. Again, these sort of, like, uh, stars um, from from the Saban era, but Isaiah Bugs to me was a star. He was a great player. 
I think Ronnie Harrison is a little underrated when it comes to like defensive backs, even though I think most people would say he doesn't belong on this list just because he, he was great when he, like when he was at Alabama, he's in the, in the NFL now doing well. We've talked about Ryan Anderson a lot, which is why I didn't include Ryan Anderson on my list. Uh, it's just a guy that we love and, and so many Alabama people love, but he, he I think he's a little underrated. Uh, Bo Scarborough. I think Bo Scarborough. Oh, absolutely, um, yes. He, he, he should have been. He should have been one of ours today for sure. Yeah, and he was a guy again. Another one. Another one of those injuries where it's like if Bo Scarborough hadn't have gotten hurt. And I know I sound like a Texas fan right now <laughs> talking about Colt McCoy, but I, and I just it feels terrible. But again, Bo Scarborough was mowing down Clemson in that I, game. I think if you go back to that season and and look at. Uh, late in the year, and particularly when they got to the playoffs against yeah. Washington. Oh, man. Uh, Bo Scarborough versus Washington is one of the most dominant performances by an Alabama running back that we have ever seen. Yeah, and, you know, people may, may have unfairly heralded him as, like, the next Derrick Henry, right? Like, just this big, bruising running back. When he was healthy, he was that. He was that mm-hmm. type of running back, and he was great. But injuries, again, part of the game. Just running through a few more of the the names. I don't know if you remember Richard Mullaney from the 2015 sure. season. A pretty yes. solid possession receiver, I think that that uh, made a big difference on the offense that I, year. I would where, say very mem- very uh, reminiscent of a guy that we see out there now in Slade Bolden. Uh, they 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 remind me of each other a good bit. Just kind of their. The, the the role they play in the offense. Let's just run through them all, Matt. Slade Bolden, Richard Mullaney, Garrick Dieter, Sam Collins, if you want to go further back. Let's just make the comparisons, Matt. Yeah. Okay, so I've got a couple of kickers here, too. Adam Griffith and Jeremy Shelley were pretty solid kickers. Sure. Alabama gets a bad rep for the kicking game during the Saban era, but those guys, those guys were good. They were good kickers. Jeremy Shelley was perfect, I think, one season. In, 2011. In Great in that 2011 season when when you know all we had were field goals uh, for for the most of the game until that Trent Richardson run and a few more DeAndre White I mentioned him before really good receiver Jesse Williams the defensive lineman yes. uh, the the monster right uh, just a fantastic personality fantastic player uh, just uh, brought a lot of brought brought a lot to the table beyond football even um, and has a, has an amazing story. Google Jesse Williams. Um, Robert Lester, I mentioned, and the last guy I'll mention, Ed Stinson, a defensive end. He played in the NFL some, but uh, he was a really solid uh, defensive player for Alabama that nobody talks about anymore. So Ed's, those, Ed's, those yeah, are my picks. Google Google Alabama practice Ed Stinson, uh, <laughs> and then just just if you're like if you're a person who carves like marble statues, like. Like if you're if you're if you're trying to like recreate Greek and Roman architecture or something, Ed Stinson is prob- probably one of the most physically imposing players that I've ever seen at an Alabama practice. Yeah, there and there are a lot of them too, man. Let's be yeah. honest. Um, but yeah, he he was good. And again, nobody talks about that guy, but you know, whatever. Well, good. That's, that's why good, we're here. Yeah, good names brought up today. Fun to go and and think about some of these guys that we haven't thought about. In a long time, one one last one from Cyber Honey, Lee Tiffin. Got to got to bring up Lee Tiffin for sure. A dude who really went through an odyssey over the course of his career at Alabama, but ended on a really good note. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, um, good good discussion today. Good names. Uh, good to remember some of these guys. And uh, thanks to everybody who participated in the discussion today. Uh, keep keep dropping your suggestions in here. Maybe we'll maybe we'll do another one of these down the road in the future. None of you are underrated. <laughs> None of you commenters are underrated. That's right. Properly got rated. All, only stars here. All, all <laughs> only all stars. All right, Ben. Thanks for uh, thanks for going through some of these names with me, and thanks to everybody who was uh, participating in the comments today and and watching from home. And uh, we'll see you guys again next week here on Bammer.